Good afternoon. It's about time for us to begin. If you would come in and take a seat, we would appreciate it. All right, how's everybody doing? Anybody sleepy? <laughs> Old timers like me, huh? All right. Well, we've got a good speaker, um, you know, who'll keep us awake as Brother Jeremiah did. That was a good lesson that he delivered for us. All right, before I forget it, some glasses were found over on this side of the auditorium, my right side. Any of you missing any glasses? Okay, nobody in here. Uh, Brother Johnson called it to my attention, and they are out at the information center, okay, with the two ladies out there. So, um, and then others of you who make announcements, Steve, and, and so forth, uh, you might remember that if um, they have, if someone makes inquiry about that. All right. Uh, Tyler uh, Binkley, one of our second year students, is going to lead us in a uh, verse of a song. That'll be number 820. If you would turn to that, please. And then after the singing of a verse of that song, Brother Gene Johnson, who is here along with his good wife, Carolyn, um, is going to lead us in prayer. Uh, they are involved in the work in Guyana and uh, are uh, at the Austinville Congregation in Decatur, Alabama. We love um, Brother and Sister Johnson. The best thing that I know about them is that they are the parents of one of my favorite students in the past, Christy, who is the wife of Doug Burleson, um, who uh, is a professor at Frieda Hardeman and also succeeded me as director of the lectureship. And Doug and Christy do a good job. And, we're proud of them, Brother Gene. So if you would, get your book. Tyler, come lead us in a verse, and then Brother Gene, lead us in prayer, and then I'll introduce our speaker. It's all seen. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wish for light to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by just across on the evergreen shore. See the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by and dwell with Jesus evermore. Let's all bow and pray together. Our Father and our God, we come before your throne at this time praising you and thanking you for being the God that you are. Thank you, Father, for loving us, even though there's times when we're not very lovable. And we just pray that you'll help us in the future to work harder toward loving you and trusting you and doing the things that you've asked us to do while we have time uh, here on this earth. Father, we pray this afternoon that as we uh, listen to these lessons and as we leave here tomorrow, May we leave determined to, to do a better job and, and to put into uh, practice the things that we have heard and learned from your word this week. We're so thankful for the school. We're thankful for all these men who are being trained now and for uh, Steve and, and uh, Will and all the faculty, Father, and for this good fellowship. we're so thankful for. Father, we pray now that you'd uh, be with us as we once again listen to some ways in which we can have a better understanding of the, how the first century church went about doing its job. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Our speaker at this hour is Mark Ray. And... <clears throat> Um, Brother Mark has been preaching for over 20 years. He is currently the preacher at the Benton Congregation in Benton, Kentucky. He has two sons, Matthew and Nathan. He um, enjoys personal work 
Uh, the thing that I think about when I think about Brother Mark has to do with personal work. He's actually put a, um, I guess you'd call it a booklet maybe, Mark, together, and I highly recommend it to you. Um, I don't know if it, where it is or how it's available, but he could tell you that, but it's, um, it's very good, and uh, we appreciate his interest um, in that. And so we are anxious to hear what Brother Mark's got to say to us about um, presenting the gospel to people all around the world. Brother Mark, come speak to us, please. Hello. It is good to see everybody today. I'm thankful that you're here. I'm thankful we have an opportunity for us to be together and study the Word of God. Uh, as David mentioned before, those booklets and a lot of the other stuff which I do, uh, I just have a WordPress blog that I put a lot of that on. Uh, it's markdray.wordpress.com. And of course, that's one of those free things. And uh, if you go there, it has, I think, every sermon I've preached since like 19, no, I haven't preached that long, uh, since about 2006. It has the bulletin articles and um, a lot of my uh, Bible class books, which we use for our Bible classes. So that's always a good thing. The, I started doing that when I taught at Magnolia Bible College down in Kosciuszko, Mississippi. And uh, the reason I did that was I wanted to help the students. Also, each one of my sermons are my little babies. And so I get to spend seven days birthing a baby, and then I have to abandon it because the brethren won't let me preach the same sermon over and over. So hopefully somebody will borrow that and use it and go on. Another thing about using a WordPress blog is you can look on it and see whenever it's checked and uh, examined. And I average about 120 hits on that blog a week. And about 50 of them are Saturday night at 7 o'clock. Not sure what that means, but anyway. All right. The uh, lesson which we're going to look at today is uh, doing evangelism in the 21st century. And I loved how the prayer went earlier today, or just a few minutes ago, where it talked about how, um, where he spoke in that prayer, talking about how we can remember how they did things in the first century. And that is really key when we think about how to do things in the 21st century. There's a lot of ways in which our culture has become eerily similar to what the Greco-Roman culture and the Judeo culture was in the very first century. But as you and I look at here, we see Matthew 28, starting there in verse 18, and Jesus said to them, go into all, what, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. That's how he started. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you even into the end of the age. If you've preached even just a dozen times, you've probably covered that verse. Because we mention a lot in church about how it's important for us to evangelize. And we'll preach this sermon, we'll preach Mark 16, 15, and 16, about preaching the gospel to every creature and a need for faith and baptism. And we'll get those across, and we make ourselves feel bad, and we make other people feel bad because we think, man, we need to be out there teaching, and we need to be out there communicating the gospel and bringing souls in and making sure that we're following the Lord. But while it's important for us to know it, a lot of times we just kind of leave feeling guilty because we don't know what we should do. We don't know how we should do what we should do and things such as that. And so... As, we look at our present situation today, and as you look at those things up there, maybe you can see it, maybe you can't. Either way, it's perfectly fine, really. The pictures are just to keep you awake. You can look up there and see those things. You see, we have a lot of people in this world, almost 7 billion people. If you ever doubt that, just go to Walmart, get in line. But you see all these people, and you see all these people uh, coming into the world. Every moment that you speak, 19 people are being born. Every moment that you speak, eight people are passing away. And so as you and I think about that, there in Benton we have two funeral homes and several people are passing away every single week. And as we're driving down the road, oftentimes I'll see, you know, somebody there at a funeral. And oftentimes I know them, oftentimes I don't know them. But every time you see a funeral, you see that a period has been placed on the end of a sentence. Now that does not mean that there's not an eternity for them, but that does mean that decision has been made. And that does mean all the influence that I have or you have on that person has already been put on that person. Now, this world is a big place. One out of every three people living today is Chinese. One of every four people living today lives in India. 
But there's a lot of what we call unchurched people, people unacquainted with Jesus, even in our neighborhoods, even in our worlds. And you can also see up there the picture of the uh, United States. The darker the color, the higher the average attendance, at least one Sunday out of a month. And so as you and I look across there, we see that Tennessee ranks about in the range of 35 40%. Uh, Kentucky, where I'm from, ranges about 36%. Now, Marshall County is different. Where I'm from is different than just about anywhere else. We're 12% members of the Lord's Church. And so the ground has been plowed pretty well where I'm at. But places where I've spent my earlier career in Mississippi, oftentimes we would be in an area where it was just maybe 2% members of the Lord's Church. And so there was a lot of work which is there, but the reason I wanted to have that up there is to see what it is that we're facing and see why it's important for us to know. Why should you and I feel a call within us to preach the gospel to other people? Well, of course, Isaiah 6 reminds us the reason that call is there is because the holiness and the mightiness of God. But also we see it's the command of Jesus among the last words which he had before he left this earth. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, Marshall Keeble, many years ago, said he loved that verse because it reminded reminded him the gospel needed to be preached even to every one of us because some of us are creatures. And so it's important for us to remember that. But we also see the third reason for us to teach others is because of how many people are in this world and how many people are making their decision for eternity. And so let's talk about how it is that you and I can evangelize people. When you and I move into a community to preach the gospel, or when you and I in a congregation look around and say, I need to reach people for Christ, how is it that we do it? Well, going back to the first century and even today, you see three main methods, right? The first and primary method that we oftentimes see in Scripture is public proclamation, which is speaking from the pulpit or speaking to a large number of people at a certain time. In Acts chapter 2, Peter and the rest of the apostles got up and they began preaching the very first gospel sermon. They went through the book of Joel, Joel chapter 2, to explain what was happening with the movement of the Spirit. They talked about Jesus and how his body was not left to corruption. They talked about how the people there had with lawless hands put the very Son of God upon a cross, and yet he was no longer in the grave. He had now had risen up. And so the people cried out and said, Men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter responded, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And on that day, 3,000 people obeyed the gospel. And we see in verse 47 that the Lord added those people to the church, along with all those who were saved daily. We go to the next chapter. In Acts chapter 3, we see Peter and John. And as Peter and John are there, we see where they also are engaging in public proclamation. About 14, 15 years later, we see Paul. And as Paul is there in the Aragopagus or Mars Hill, depending on how you want to say it, we see where he is preaching among the marketplace, the most philosophical city of the day. Epicureans and Stoics, the great philosophers of the day, and Paul is there preaching the gospel. And what we see in Acts 17 is that the gospel will stand up to any modern philosophy. Many people will ridicule it. Many people will laugh at it. Many people will call us seed pickers or hay pickers, as you look at the Hebrew there, some strange, th- or excuse me, the Greek there, some strange thing. But Paul stands up and he preaches about how those folks needed to repent. He stands up and he preaches about the judgment which is to come. And he tells them about the God who is over all, who determines the times and the seasons and the boundaries of the nations. And he talks about what you and I must do in order to be a Christian. Well, today we have public proclamation. And every Sunday and every Sunday night and every Wednesday night, we hear the preaching of the Word of God. We go to good lectureships and we hear the preaching of the Word of God. And that is powerful. It is so powerful to hear that preaching. As a matter of fact, Paul would say by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit over there in Romans chapter 10, how beautiful are the feet of those who come and preach the gospel of the good tidings of peace. And so that's one way in which we do it. A second way in which is becoming even more and more fascinating each and every day, it seems, in our society, is proclamation through the media. And that is through writings or through electronic means even today. As you and I read in our Bibles, we see this happen even in the first century, right? We see in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul begins, or excuse, yeah, Paul begins writing about the scripture, the graphia, 
He says, all that scripture is given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete. And as you see that, and you look in Hebrews 4.12 and see how the living word of God is powerful, we see that even in the first century, Paul understood and the apostles understood that they could write scripture to be able to reach more people than just whom they were in the room with. Well, you and I today also have means of using media to reach other folks. There's a fella named Jewel Miller. Maybe you've heard of him. And whenever I hear Jewel Miller, I think of my father. He, he always enjoyed doing uh, evangelistic work with Jewel Miller. And so every time I hear Jewel Miller in the background, I hear something go ping, because that was back when they had the uh, film strips. And so you just hear the ping. It feels like you're in a submarine or something. But Jewel Miller began at Harding University in 1945, and he was a touch on the bum side from what I understand, because he realized he's bummed. He wasn't a bum. He was kind of on the bum. He was upset. He realized he was not as eloquent as some other people were from the pulpit. And so he began exploring different ways in which he could spread the gospel, and one of the things he enjoyed doing was cutting-edge technology that day was the film strip. And so he created a film strip series of four or five different uh, cassette tapes or film strips. And through that, he has baptized tens of thousands of people. Now, what's interesting is many of those people who went through Harding during that time were very effective gospel preachers. But I'm not sure how many people they baptized more than Joel Miller, who is a man who may not be considered eloquent by some, but used what he had through media work to bring many people to Christ. And this is an amazing thing which we see around us today. We see people with blogs, we see people with podcasts, we see people who are able to work in many different things. I, if I'm not mistaken, we're probably on YouTube or perhaps even live stream today. And though I preach in Benton, Kentucky, uh, there are two congregations in the West, one in Oregon and one in Washington that oftentimes on Sunday nights will worship with us via live stream. They will listen to our singing and they'll engage with us as we preach. And so it's a way for a church far away that maybe does not have a preacher yet to be able to worship along with another congregation and hear preaching from God's word. And so there's many different avenues as far as media goes for us to reach out to the lost. And, it, and if you have teenagers like I do, you know they're always looking on their phones. And there's many apps and things such as that where you can find really good information. And so that's another avenue which we can go through. But the third avenue I want us to look at, and actually we'll spend more, more of our time focusing on this today, is through personal relationships. John makes it very clear in his gospel about the power of a personal relationship. He includes a lot of sermons. He includes a lot of even media work, if you will, but he spent a lot of time on personal work. We look there in John chapter 1, look at verses 40 and 41, you see a guy named Andrew. And you don't see much about Andrew preaching, of course, right? But every time you see Andrew, he is bringing someone to Jesus. And oftentimes we'll focus on how he's bringing someone to Jesus. Andrew heard Jesus, and as soon as he heard Jesus, what did he do? He went and got his brother, and you probably have heard of his brother somewhere in the Bible, Peter. Peter, come look who I've found. And Peter comes, and Jesus changes his name to Rock because he's going to be one of the foundational pieces of the early church, according to Galatians 2.15. A little bit later in the book of John, we see where Jesus is looking at the crowd, and he says, we need to feed these people. How are we going to do it? Well, all the apostles are looking at themselves and saying, we have no money. Uh, there's nothing we can do. There's too many people. We, we're just going to have to send them away. They're not going to be able to hear you preach, Jesus, because we have no way to take care of it. Andrew took what he had, and he brought it to Jesus. He found a boy with just a few loaves and just a few fishes, and he brought that boy to Jesus, and Jesus took what he had and accomplished great things. There at the end of the book, we once again, we see Andrew, and Andrew is there, and he is to, brought to him are some Gentiles. And so he, get, he gets these Gentiles and he brings them to Jesus, which is a precursor, if you will, to how the church is going to grow. And so what we look at when we look at personal relationships is how you and I can be an Andrew. Now, I did a test last Sunday. 
I wanted to preach this and see if the sermon really worked in under an hour, so I practiced on the brethren back home. That may not be good because I went Sunday morning and Sunday night, so, but I will let you out. One thing we see in most congregations, and which I saw in Benton last Sunday, was I said, okay, if you were converted at a gospel meeting, or if you were converted by a preacher or a sermon specifically, raise your hand. And we had about 15 people raise their hands. And I said, now, if you were converted by a book, or if you were converted by a blog post, or if you were converted by a podcast, raise your hand. We had three. Muscle and Shovel had done that good work there at that congregation. No, we had two. Muscle and Shovel had done a good work at that congregation. And I said, but how many of us have been converted by our parents, by a spouse, by friends at work or friends at school or by a neighbor or even somebody who came by and knocked on our door. And the rest of the people raised their hands. Now, we probably have a different crew here. Many people who are in preaching school or many people who are preachers probably have learned quite a bit more than your average Christian would by reading and by hearing sermons and things such as that. But just about every one of us can talk about the relationship we have with Jesus and we see it through the lens of a personal relationship. And that's really how I think the gospel was promulgated or spread today. You see, we have a lot of friends. Maybe you on Facebook have 500 friends, and maybe on Twitter or something like that, you have a lot of people who follow you, and Instagram and Snapchat and things such as that. But one thing that's happening in our society is actually we don't have that many friends. But the friends we have really, really influences. We become the sum of the five closest friends which we have. And so it's important for us to focus on those personal relationships and learn how we can use those relationships to help us uh, reach out to other folks. And so go ahead and turn in your Bible to John 4 and let's talk about how Jesus used personal relationships. Now as you and I think about this in John 4 we see that we have to be careful. We can't come across as a uh, the sleazy person who is trying to just make another sale at the car lot. We can't come across as a sleazy person who's trying to sell somebody something that they don't ne really need, so we're just trying to fool them. But we realize that we are showing other people how to find Jesus. And so we recognize that the most powerful tool we have is through relationship. And so think about your relationship and see how it is that you can preach the gospel to other people. Well, you see, as we look here in John chapter 4, and you, see, you look pretty closely, you've heard preach several times, probably a focus on verse 4. He had or he needed to go through Samaria. And you go a little bit later, and you see in verse 7 where he says, give me something to drink. Now, we'll talk about that in a little bit more here, but what I want us to notice in that first section is Jesus recognized he needed to go where the people were. Now, he spent a lot of time an amazing amount of time, especially in the book of John, in the temple. There's a lot of temple preaching going on in John. But you see that he also recognized the need to get out of the temple, sometimes to get out of Jerusalem, to find those who are lost. In Luke 15, he spent time in the houses of the sinners and the tax collectors. And so it's important for us, if we're going to try to bring other people to Jesus, that we go to people where they are. Your mission field is where you work. Your mission field could very well be your school. Your mission field could very well be even your home as you work to raise your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now, once again, looking there in verse 7, Jesus not only went to where they were, he shared with them. In verse 7, he says, give me a drink. Now, think about that. You and I today, we probably just had lunch a little bit ago, right? Imagine if your neighbor had told you, hey, let's just share cups, okay? Now, if you're married to your neighbor, you're probably sort of okay with that. If you're not married, especially if you don't know your neighbor, you're like, no way. Well, here's Jesus talking to a woman, talking to a Samaritan woman, talking to a lady who had been married five times, had five husbands, and was just living with somebody. On the hottest part of the day, sometime around noon, and he says, listen, I'm, you know, you don't know me. I don't really know you, but I'm willing to put my lips right where your lips are. He was willing to be around 
people. And if we're going to do evangelism, we have to be around people. It's important for us to look at those sort of things to see how is it that we can reach other folks. I believe in gospel meetings, and we push them really hard where I work. And I believe in a lot of different things we do to get people into the building. We have a preschool, an after school. We have a fish fry that sometimes will bring up to 600 people there. We have a lot of different things which we do to get people to the building. And each one of those are good. And many times we'll gain a family or two every time we do that. But it's also very, very important for us to be the church outside of the building, to bring people closer to Jesus. Well, we go a little bit later, and we get to, uh, let's see, verse 14. Try verse 14 out. You see there where he speaks of water. And what we see is where he changes the conversation to one that's spiritual in nature. This lady cared about water. She probably was embarrassed. We don't know exactly all the background. But she's going at the hottest time of day, walking a good distance, and she is there in a very uh, inopportune time, if you will. And so she's thirsty, and she's getting water for her family. What Jesus says, listen, if you're getting this water, let me tell you about living water that you'll never be thirsty again. And that starts a conversation off as she wants to know exactly what it is Jesus is talking about. He's learned about people enough to know how to change the conversation to one that's spiritual in nature. I think that's something pretty important because a lot of times we get confused about what we can say and what we can't say, right? What are the two things you're not allowed to talk about? Politics and religion, right? I don't know if that rule lasts anymore because, man, people like talking about politics nowadays. Ooh. That's something they enjoy talking about, but it's hard to keep people from getting angry with it. But you can talk religion, and people actually enjoy talking about the faith that they have. Now, you have to be careful not to get in an argument sometimes, and you have to be careful sometimes in controlling what the, where the conversation is going so that you can still be a good example and so you can still leave the door open for further study. But be willing to talk to people about what the sermon was about last Sunday. Or about what's going on at church. Or have a verse that when the problem comes up in life, it's a verse that you think about and a verse that you dwell on and a verse that you can share with other people. When you're on Facebook, that is if you're over 30, because people under 30 claim they're not on Facebook, have spiritual things that you talk about. And talk about things at church in a very positive way. When you're on Twitter or you're on Snapchat if you're under 30, Speak about church, the faith you have in God. Use something which talks about the way in which God operates in your life and helps you. And thirdly, as we look here, we see that Jesus was very good because he did not get distracted. I get distracted. I had somebody tell me at church I was an Acts 8-4 preacher because I went everywhere preaching the word. I don't know what that meant about my sermon, except I probably kept them too long, but... Sometimes we get to be an Acts 8-4 person. We go all over the place, and people will bring up this subject and that subject and whatever else in the world it may be. Jesus did not allow the conversation to get away from him, and he did not allow it to get away from what this lady needed to do to be faithful to God. So you and I see there in verse 20, you see the first distraction. She says, oh, spiritual conversation. I know how to put this to an end. Oh, tell me where you worship. Of course, she was a Samaritan. They worshiped on Mount Gerizim. They had their own temple there. They claimed that was where Moses got his Ten Commandments. That that's where Noah landed on his ark. Everything was around Mount Gerizim. And she knew that Jesus was over there in Jerusalem. And she knew that if she brought up this religious argument, then you have got it made because everybody's going to go in their circles and the focus will no longer be on her. Well, Jesus reminded her, the Jews know what they're talking about. God is a spirit. He worships the spirit and truth. And then he brought it right back to her once again. He didn't let her get away. We go a little bit later as we look through here. In verse 25, she says, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. When the Messiah comes, you know, then he'll tell us about all these things. And he says, I who speak to you am he. He kept it very pointed towards her and did not let her distract the conversation. A lot of times in our religious conversations, we end up getting distracted. You may talk to someone who has no identity about the church and has no understanding, and the first thing they want to talk about is, why is it you don't have a piano? 
Well, you can easily explain that, but oftentimes if you spend your time explaining that, you've lost your opportunity to really talk about Jesus and talk about how to be saved. There's some times where we'll enter into a conversation with somebody and they'll want to chase after this doctrine or that doctrine. And it's okay to answer some questions, but always come back to what Christianity means to you and to the person that you're talking with. We need to see how we can leverage our personal relationships so that we can do right. All right, our last part is look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because... In order to be a good craftsman, you have to have good tools, right? If you go and see a carpenter who really knows what he's doing for a living, he's going to have nice tools. If you go and see anybody who has any occupation, if they're professional, they're going to have good tools. The tool that you use is Jesus Christ, of course, but the other tool you use in personal evangelism is yourself. As Paul was able to say in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me even as I follow Christ. And we see in this passage, very quickly and easily, uh, what Paul says when he talks about how we use ourselves as evangelists. 2 Corinthians is always a tough book to um, outline because Paul talks about three subjects back and forth in different orders. And so people like me who want to outline a book and memorize the outline and things like that, 2 Corinthians is tough. Paul goes through, he talks about his defense for the apostleship, he talks about giving, and he talks about how we deal with issues in life. And so sometimes 2 Corinthians is a little bit tough for us, but this passage is beautiful as we go through it. Let's go ahead and look at it. If any man is in Christ, behold, if, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, behold, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Now all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled himself to, through us, through Jesus Christ, and has given us his ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in us, in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he has committed to us this word of reconciliation. Now then, he says, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled unto God. Verse 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We're going to look at five points real quickly through here that each one of us need to have. First point, of course, you see circled, hopefully, if it went up there the way it should. You see the aspect of authenticity. And I think this is one of the most important things in the present world that you need to have. You got a lot of Christians who know the right thing and say the right thing, perhaps even believe the right thing, but they don't do the right thing. It's not enough. It doesn't make you a Christian. It's not enough to be at the right building at the right time. It's not enough to go through the motions of Christianity if your heart's not there. And so what you see here is that we must be authentic. You and I must be fully converted if we're going to bring other people to Jesus. You see, those who are in Christ, the old man is put away, and now the new man has come. How many congregations have we seen where instead of reaching out to the world, we have congregations full of selfishness and congregations full of division and congregations full of folks who aren't forgiven one another and churches which are just full of all these works of the flesh instead of putting these things aside and they're not reaching ahead to what they need to do in order to follow after Jesus. You see, it gets us in trouble. And so, first and foremost, what is someone looking in us if we're going to be an evangelist? They're looking in us, especially in the modern-day millennial thought process, they're looking for someone who's authentic, who truly believes what they're doing. This next word, I don't mean for this to be blasphemous in any way, because usually we use it in connection with Christ. But what I mean for it, as I use this word, is that we are among the people. You see, Jesus was the incarnation of God. He was God here upon this earth. John 1, 14, the word became flesh, and that flesh dwelt among us. You look at some of the older translations, or perhaps even the Greek, you see it's like somebody who just put up a tent right in the middle of our campground. You always see people like that, perhaps. I'm a uh, scoutmaster in uh, Boy Scouts, and it's one of the jobs I really enjoy, uh, taking my boys out. And one thing invariably happens, and I would never have the courage to do it, but we always have it happen. We'll get out there camping, and we will start cooking and um, 
you know, some boys exercise, some boys tie knots. Everybody in my troop is pretty good size. We like to cook. That's what we do. So we always have really good food. And invariably, I'll look up around somewhere and I'll see somebody I've never seen before in my life. And they've just kind of walked in and they're like, hey. Usually we feed them because we're Boy Scouts and there's some rule that you have to do that, I think. But in a sense, that's what we do as Christians. Not in a rude sense, but you have to be among the people. You have to be among those who you can teach, who you can help. What is it that Jesus said? Go and preach the gospel to every creature. It's so very, very necessary for us to teach the gospel, to be around people so that we can have an influence upon them. We are to be salt. We are to be light. But salt does not work unless it's out of the salt shaker, right? You can have salt, and it will last forever, and you'll never have to go to the store again to get any more if you never use it, but really, it's worthless as long as it's in, that, it's in that salt shaker. Light is powerful. But if you never turn on lights, if you never turn on a flashlight, it does not affect the world that's around us. And one thing I think may happen in the church today is we put ourselves in a bubble because we're afraid of outside influence. And a lot of times that fear is actually pretty legitimate. But we have to get into the world to influence this world and to preserve it as well. The next point I want us to look at is this idea of humility. What do we mean when we talk of humility? There is a perception among churches of Christ that people have oftentimes. And that perception is that, is that we are very prideful. What is it we always hear, the old cliche, oh, you think you're the only ones? What's the other part? Go on. Y'all hear that too sometimes. And I, I really haven't met anybody who really, you know, has gone through doing evangelism who's told everybody that. Maybe someone did somewhere. I actually think it's one of the few defense arguments some people try to use. I, I don't know where it's really come from. But check yourself. Watch your perception that people have of you. And make sure that you're a humble person. Don't come across in a prideful way of saying, hey, I'm smarter than you, so you better read the Bible the way I tell you to read the Bible. Don't come across to people to say, hey, I've got every answer that's ever been asked, and I'm the expert. John Stott, a man who died several years ago, uh, was over in England. But he coined a phrase in his definition of Christianity, and it's this. Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And that's the attitude that you and I need to have. Yes, I'm not perfect, but I'm forgiven. And let me share with you the good news that I have. Remember, that's what the gospel is, is good news. Let us never forget Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm included in that all. Romans 3, 9, Romans 3, 10, there's no unrighteous, no, not one. Both Jew and Greek, they are all under sin. Even Paul, over in Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 15, a man who had written half the books of the New Testament, a man who was responsible through the power of God to introducing Christianity into Europe as he went into Greece, even a man who had led many, many people to Christ, Several years after his conversion, says this, 1 Timothy 1, 15. Now here's a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. You see, Paul did not come across in a prideful way. He recognized he had been forgiven. He recognized he had done the worst sins, and, but he had found forgiveness. He had found hope. He had found the mercy and the grace of God, and therefore he wanted to share it with other people. That's the attitude that I've got to have. And that's the attitude that every one of us has to have as well. Let me go a little bit further. And notice the power of that word, implore. You see that word there? He's not just saying, hey, it'd be a suggestion if you, uh, where, you, know, if you would go to Christ. It's not just a nice thing if you would obey the gospel. You have to recognize how important it is to teach lost people. 
We say intellectually we believe in hell. But if we truly believe in hell, wow, what are we going to think on that last day when we see so many people go in that wrong direction? When's the last time your heart was pricked when you're in Walmart, when you're on the freeway? And you look around and you see all these people as sheep without a shepherd. Paul put it this way. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God, right? That word power goes back to a word that sounds a lot like dynamite, talking about how nothing can stand, withstand the power of the gospel. But the problem is today is it's not the lack of effectiveness of the gospel. It's the lack of drive within a Christian. We need to give ourselves fully to Jesus to follow after him. Romans 12, 1 speaks of how we are living sacrifices, giving ourselves completely, wholly, and absolutely to Christ. Now, the last point I want us to look at is this idea of being specific or being concise. Paul was able to put it down into one sentence. I remember back at preaching school, I was told that a good sermon could go only down to one sentence. I thought to myself, well, why am I talking for 20 minutes? Well, you need to be able to boil it down to know exactly what it is you want to communicate. And if you want to know the gospel in one verse, here you are. He made him, that is Jesus, to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The gospel comes across very clearly, plainly, simply. Jesus has stood in my place so that I can stand in his place. And Jesus... No matter what sin you may have done, no matter what your past may be, and no matter what your reputation may be, Jesus died on the cross for you. And by gospel obedience, by following in him in faith, every one of us can be added to the Lord's church. And every one of us can be saved. And so that's my lesson. Many years ago when I was in Odessa, Texas, I decided I wanted to be a preacher. And I told my mom, and my mom was not happy. She said, preachers always get fired. And I agreed, and I said, but I really want to do it. And she said, okay. And here was her suggestion. She said, I don't know if you'll ever be a good preacher, but if you let people out early, they will always love you. So that's what I've always tried to do, except at Benton. That's what I've always tried to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Mark. We really appreciate those remarks. I commend the manuscript uh, 